Hey guys, in this video we're going to go over the Japanese Type 14 Nambu pistol, a pistol that I think is really misunderstood. Now let's start off with the nomenclature behind this gun. So Type 14, it doesn't have anything to do with like the 14th iteration of the pistol or anything like that. Um, the, the 14 is from the 14th uh, year of the Taisho's reign. Um, the, because the army adopted it in 1925, which was uh, the 14th year. The Navy adopted it in 1927, but that doesn't make it like the Type 16 of the Navy. They just, you know, all called it the Type 14. Um, now, th the interesting thing is between the Japanese Army and Navy, a lot of people don't truly understand, is that they were very competitive, very rival branches. Like, uh, imagine the, the, you know, the inter-service rivalry in the United States and kick it up a notch with the Japanese, uh, you know, Imperial military, um, the, the Japanese Navy had its own planes and, and, and carriers and everything, just like the Army did. Um, they really competed for a lot of the same resources and everything. They had kind of different um, supply routes for getting their own getting their own stuff. It's kind of why the Japanese Navy went after the, the Type I Carcano. Um, but anyway, the, the Type 14 is, is one of those pistols that's... A lot of people, I think, really misunderstand you know, the, uh, the, what this pistol is and, and why it is what it is. We, I think we tend to look at this gun by today's standards or maybe even by the 19, you know, 40 standards and think, wow, this is a really backwards gun. Um, a lot of people really tend to point out the cartridge as being weak, which is interesting. You know, 8x22 Nambu, it's not a powerful cartridge. You know, it's, it's about, everyone kind of says it's about like 380. <laughs> Which 380 isn't really that bad. There's a lot of militaries out there that had handguns in 380. You have the you know the Italians with their um, Breda 1934s. You have the Czechs with their uh, CZ24, CZ27s, and then their CZ38s. Um, I mean, there's quite a few militaries. Uh, the, the Hungarians with the 37M. There's quite a few militaries that had their their main combat pistol was about this power range. Um, which they don't get picked on at all for being in 380, but the Nambu gets picked on for having a you know, a pistol, you know, a cartridge in, in that power range. I'm not sure, maybe because it's, you know, it's bottleneck, it's kind of an outdated design. Maybe maybe that's one of the reasons why it gets picked on. But that's one of the things that's really kind of, just kind of interested me about the gun. It's just, it's very, very picked on. Everything about this gun gets picked on. Now calling the Type 14 a, a Nambu or Nambu is, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, I think it's, I think it's a good analogy as like Browning uh, or John Moses Browning with the Browning high power pistol. Um, their involvement with it, they kind of got the design started, they came up with early designs, but, you know, Nambu and Browning, their overall impact in the end pistol is probably not that much. It was probably done by a lot of other people. So with the Type 14, Nambu's involvement with this gun is probably not a whole lot. The, the simplification of this gun was probably done a lot by other people. Uh, and that's because the, the 14, the Type 14, it's a great, greatly simplified, basically, Papa Nambu, or like the 1902 Nambu. Um, this, this gun is, is, they took a lot of the quirks and idiosyncrasies of the older Papa Nambu, and I think they did a good job in, in streamlining it overall. You know, the Papa's pretty, it's a pretty complicated pistol, and, and the Type 14 isn't really. This isn't an overly complicated pistol. It's a little quirky, you know, especially coming from, you know, from the West. It, it's a quirky design, which is pretty neat to me. Um, this was this was the first Type 14 that I've owned. And uh, and it's funny, I, I, it was a good deal, so I bought it. And and it, it, it clicked, like I got it. Like the it, the coolness of this gun just kind of clicked with me. And, um, it, you know, it, and it's just one of these really kind of funky, cool sort of designs. Um, Taken into parts, very different from a lot of other, you know, designs out there, especially like Browning designs and whatnot. Um, and it's just quirky and cool. Like it's just, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of this gun. Now let's go over some of the biggest changes um, from the Papa Nambu to the Type 14. They replaced the grip safety with a manual safety on the left side of the pistol. They simplified and they cut away the top of the frame except for a small area for the rear sight. The bolt and recoil spring were redesigned to eliminate the left side offset. There's a now a, a fixed rear sight which replaced uh, the tangent sight. There's now a fixed lanyard loop. Uh, it replaced the a little slightly more complicated pivot type of lanyard loop. The grip panels were simplified and the contour and the, um, these grooves in the grip replace the checkering pattern. The magazine release was greatly simplified and it no longer protrudes uh, greatly from the side of the pistol. Overall, the Type 14, it's, it's lighter than the Papa Nambu. 
it's cheaper and faster to produce, and it's also a lot more simple to disassemble and maintain in the field. Um, so really this gun is a win-win. Now the, the Papa Nambu wasn't crazy far behind in its time, and, uh, and so simplifying that pistol into, into this gun, especially from the mindset of the 1920s, uh, it isn't that crazy, really. Um, you know, we look at this Type 14 from what other pistols existed in the 40s, but we really kind of need like a 1920s mentality when we look at the Type 14 Nambu and what other pistols out there. Yeah, there's a lot of really good, you know, Browning designs at the time, but the Japanese are kind of a world away from a lot of that innovation. And, uh, and so if, you know, if they're nationalistic and you want a native design, this really isn't a terrible one for the 1920s. You see a lot of other really quirky guns coming out in the 20s and 30s in Europe. Um, so I don't think this one's really that far-fetched. Now let's get in and do some close-ups of the Type 14. We'll go over some of the features of the pistol um, up close so that you can see. And we're also going to throw in a last-ditch uh, Type 14 as well and kind of show you some of the differences between those as well. Now to go over some of the markings on the pistol, uh, here on the right side of the frame, this, is, this pretty much just says... 14 type pretty much um, this it's 10 for type um, it's, it's kind of written out in Japanese but this just says type 14 um, here are the two markings so this is uh, this is fire and back is safe and uh, the the kanji here um, this marking doesn't mean fire as much as it means like flame it means like an actual physical fire and this marking here means uh, at peace now this sort of arcing you know groove or, or marking that's in the frame this just kind of appears on all nambus this just sort of happens from you know working the safety it's sort of like with an ak it's you know you can't you can't really help but getting you know this this circular line in the gun now when you have the pistol in your hand there's just no way you can reach the safety it's really meant to to be worked with your off hand um, I mean, it's you definitely cannot flick the safety off now one of the things to know about the safety um, when it is on safe, um, not only can the pistol not fire, but it also locks the gun so you can't rack the action. I guess it's sort of like, you could think of it like with a Mauser, when the safety's on, um, you can't work the action at all. So if you're trying to work one of these and it feels stuck, uh, you know, just, just take the safety off and, then, uh, and that'll free it up for you. Now on the right side of the pistol, you'll see uh, the manufacturer's markings. Uh, there's five different manufacturers of these. Uh, two of them are pretty much like the same first symbol. Um, so just because you see this symbol, it doesn't mean it's the same factory necessarily as, a, as another pistol. You kind of have to look at the second symbol um, that's to the right of the first one to, to really kind of see. And then sometimes you have to look at like the date and to find out when it is. So um, the best thing to do is look at a chart, um, find a chart and uh, look at that. Now the top, this is just the serial number of the pistol, just pretty standard markings. They didn't really make enough of these that they had to do, you know, prefixes or suffixes or anything like that. They didn't make a whole lot of these. Um, it's only just kind of like was in the, the low thousands per year or something like that. So um, you don't see crazy long serials or, or prefixes or suffixes really with these. Uh, down here now, uh, this is the date. So it's pretty nice. It's, it's kind of the only pistol that I know of or any the, the military gun that I know of that marked the, the month. So this is the year and the month. So this one is 18.12. Uh, so the way it works with the adoption, you add 25 for 1925 uh, to the 18 here. So this is, uh, that makes 1943. And then 12 is the 12th month, so December. So this is uh, December of 1943 gun. Uh, so most likely, you know, this one went out uh, probably in 1944 or something like that. So you might be wondering about this sort of odd shape to the trigger guard. Now originally it was circular, it looked kind of something like this, the earlier, the earlier specimens. Um, now in 1939 they changed that, they extended it out to make it much easier, you know, to wear with gloved hands. Um, this is something that you start seeing in like late 1939 pistols. Um, so early Nambus, you won't see this. Um, it'll just sort of look like a circular uh, sort of trigger guard. Now, um, another thing that was added around a similar time was this uh, magazine retention spring, which is uh, down here on the bottom. Um, so this is an S-shaped spring. Uh, it goes down inside uh, the magazine well, and you could see it there at the bottom. Uh, this was added around the same time, and what it does 
Um, the magazine's retention spring, it sort of fits in here. And you might be able to see this little like bluing rubbed off line on the front here, just from the retention spring. Uh, they were having a problem where you could press, you know, the magazine release and the magazines would just fall straight out of the gun, which you might not see what the problem is really as a modern shooter. Uh, but for the Japanese, they were losing magazines, uh, you know, just by hitting this button. The magazine would fall out. They wouldn't catch it, you know, in combat or whatever. It would be lost. Uh, so they wanted to slow down that. So pretty much if you hit the magazine release, it doesn't do anything. You have to actually physically grab and pull the magazine out. Now these magazines are numbered down here. You see this is 309. So this one is matching to this pistol. Uh, that's something you wanna check for whenever you collect these guns is that the, the magazine matches the pistol because it's very uncommon uh, or it's very common to find these with mismatched uh, magazines. Um, that might be a collector's thing or that might be just from you know, magazines falling out, getting lost, whatever, but something to check. Now speaking of magazines, uh, this gun is cocked right now. So if I pull the trigger, I have a uh, I have a snap cap in here. So if I pull the trigger, um, you know the the gun will will fire. So I'll just uh, cock the gun again, and with the magazine out, um, the gun will not fire because there is a uh, it's a very simple magazine safety in the gun. There's just simply you could just kind of barely see it over the tip of my finger there. Um, without a magazine, there's a spring that pushes this little. Uh, lever sort of piece in the way of the uh, the trigger so that the uh, the trigger can't be pulled and now when i insert this magazine let's try to look under there and you should see that now moved so the trigger can now be uh, pulled and the gun can go off uh, that's something that was added in 1932 i'm not a big fan of magazine safeties but i guess if it wasn't on the initial design and it was added they had a good reason for it so Type 14s, they sort of have a cocking indicator. Like there's a, there's a way that you can feel if the gun is cocked. There's not a loaded chamber indicator really with these. Um, but what you can do is you can go back here to the rear of the cocking knob. You'll see this little protrusion. Uh, what you do is you just push this in with your finger. And right now uh, there's a new set of uh, wolf springs in this gun. So it's pretty, the, the springs are pretty good. Um, and you can press and I mean, it's, it's really working against your finger. Now, if the gun has been fired and it is decocked, um, then this pushes in pretty easy, relatively easy. Um, so there's like a quasi sort of way of, of seeing if the Type 14 is cocked or not. Now, when I was just dry firing, I was using a, a snap cap uh, because that's pretty important with these guns. Um, the, the strikers are fairly fragile. It, they were redesigned fairly early on to be a little bit stronger but that's just a chronic problem with these Type 14s. If you're looking at buying one, if you can, take it apart, uh, take the striker out and make sure that the tip is not broken because if it is, you're gonna have to buy a new striker for your pistol. They're not crazy expensive. They make reproduction strikers, uh, but it's just something you're gonna need to look for with these. Um, it's probably less fragile than you think but it's just something kind of everybody mentions about the Type 14s, the, you know, the fragile strikers. Buy a spare if you're gonna shoot yours, also put new springs in it. Well, there's a few variations with the wood grips you'll find out there with the type of wood, the finish, and then uh, these little lines or serrations or grooves or whatever you wanna call them in the, in the grips here. Uh, this is a later grip. Um, this is when the, the total number of lines in it was reduced. Um, the very early grips, you'll, you'll count the, the, the grip lines go all the way to the top there'll be about 26 of them in there. Um, that was reduced shortly after to 25, but the line still did go all the way to the top. Now, middle of the war, something like that, they switched over to this, uh, and only some manufacturers did it, so there's not like a super hard and fast rule that I'm aware of for this. Um, but uh, mid-war, they switched to this, you know, reduced only 17 line uh, grip pattern, which is this one here. It makes sense why they did it, because when you grip this pistol with only 17 lines, I mean, the parts that your fingers are grabbing onto, you know, they, they are serrated. You don't really need serrations up here. Um, so I, I, think, I think this 17, you know, groove line is fine. You might find the ones with the full grips, you know, full lined on the wood grips are prettier. You know, that, that's sort of up to you. Uh, here's a last ditch. Uh, to show you an example of the uh, the later slab side uh, grip panels, obviously 
different color and, and no grooves in it. So, so very late, they switched um, to the slab side, but uh, earlier on here, you can kind of see some of the, the differences between uh, just the wood color. These would be, you know, coated to kind of make them darker and they'd be sealed up. Later, they really didn't do that. You can see a lot of the wood grain in this, in this later one here too, but um, that's just some of, the, some of the differences between these guns. So another thing worth mentioning with the uh, Type 14 is that the gun does have a uh, magazine hold open. So if you have an empty magazine in the gun and, uh, and you fire the gun, the magazine will stay back. Uh, okay, but the only thing is, uh, as soon as you remove the magazine, the action goes forward. So, if you then loaded a new magazine, you would then have to, you know, rack the action as if you didn't even have a magazine hold open. Um, this is not the only pistol that has that. This is, it seems fairly common for pistols in, you know, the 20s and 30s. You see quite a few other handguns that have this. Uh, I guess it's better than no hold open because you can at least, you know, you shoot the gun and maybe this is like your point of view and you kind of go, oh, you know, the gun's empty. Uh, I guess at least it lets you know, but it's still, you know, you still have to recock it after you load a fresh magazine. So some of the stats of the Type 14, the pistol's almost exactly two pounds. It's uh, 900 grams. Uh, the barrel is uh, 117 millimeters, which is uh, 4.6 inches. So it's it's a decent combat handgun, you know, barrel length to it. Um, capacity is eight rounds, which does not seem like a lot for how sort of crazy long um, this grip is. Like, I mean, I could get all four of my fingers and, and some more. You could have pretty monster big hands and still be able to get all four fingers are on this grip. I mean, I think aesthetically, I like the look, but I mean, really the grip could have been shortened up a lot um, or at least get more than, you know, eight rounds for this, for this extra length. So now obviously the war is not going very well for the Japanese. And just kind of like they do with the rifles, you kind of see a lot of these simplifications and the quote unquote last ditch models of, of the guns. So um, this type 14 here is an example of a quote unquote last ditch. I'll just keep saying that because I don't really know a better, catchier way of describing this gun. Um, now, this model is a, is a May of 1945. So I'll show you right here. Um, so 20, as I said before, you add 25 to that. So that's 1945. And that's a five there for the fifth month. So this is a, a May of 1945. Uh, and you can see the maker's mark here. This is a Tori Matsu uh, made pistol. Uh, the serial number didn't reset every year um, because by the end they weren't making they weren't making thousands every month. Um, they were only making you know a relative few every month. And there's no like hard and fast rule for these. There's no like distinct cutoff where after this date you see all of this sort of features. Um, you can see a pretty big mismatch of, of parts in 1945. Um, so you'll probably notice this uh, late war here cocking knob. This is just a nice circular cocking knob with just, you know, knurling done to it. Uh, this was a simplification of this earlier sort of grooved style cocking knob. Now you will find these late war pistols with the simplified cocking knob and grooved grips, 17 grooves or the, or the 25 groove grips. You'll find guns with, you know, the early cocking knob with the slab side grips really by you know about may or so you see all sorts of different parts you'll see kind of you know full last ditch guns like this one and and then you'll see you know guns that kind of have a mixture of, of early and, and later parts um, it's kind of all over the place again it adds some neat variety to collecting these guns um, but there's no hard and fast rule now i'll go over some of the differences uh, between this last ditch and, a, and an earlier gun, like a mid-war gun, uh, like this one here. The first and the biggest is just the machine marks that you'll find all over these guns. Um, I don't know if you could see here, so in the trigger guard, here's the mid gun, and you could see some of this real rough machining. Same thing with the, slide, the side of the frame. You see these kind of you know, rough markings all along the side um, that Earlier on, I mean, even like 1943, 1944 pistols are pretty clean and pretty well made. 
But uh, you know, later in 45, the quality just really dropped off with these. So you find you know, pretty rough machine marks on, on these later guns. Now in May, they started using a lot of rejected parts, you know, parts that previously that they wouldn't have used in guns. Um, you you kind of see those mixed in. Some of those parts will have an X on it. Um, really in May, the quality kind of takes a nose dive. June was pretty much the last like real full production mark. After June of 1945, you don't see inspectors marks and stuff on these guns. Some won't be serialized, some won't be dated. It's, it's, they get real rough after June. Um, July guns and August guns are a hot mess. It's really pretty chaotic after, after about May, June of 45. Now when looking at the production numbers for Type 14s in 1945, there's kind of two numbers to look at. There's the official production numbers, and then there's this kind of estimate from collectors that's calculated from like reported guns and the, and the dates on the side of guns, stuff like that. Like for example, the official reported numbers is that no Type 14s were made in August, but there are August dated guns out there. Um, so kind of take these official numbers that I'm gonna read here with a grain of salt. Uh, but officially there was 1,329 uh, Nambus May and May, um, 655 in June, 1,083 in July, and none in August. Now the best guess for what collectors think is the actual number is that May, 1,078 pistols made, uh, June, 741, July, 761, and August, 368. So you can see the numbers vary quite a bit between the official you know, records and the collector records. I tend to prefer the collector records. I mean, by August especially, I don't think they care. I mean, they're weeks away from surrendering. They literally got nuked. You know, they're probably not caring about recording numbers and stuff like that as much. So I tend to trust the estimated numbers based off of serials more than the official numbers. Uh, only about 5,000 Type 14s are made in 1945 at all. Um, so I think these really late, you know, last ditch guns are, are pretty neat because of that. I mean, you know, almost just as many of these last ditch guns exist as just like one year of one manufacturer of the early Type 14. So again, this is just some pretty neat variation um, between this. Uh, if, you, if you like collecting different types, you know, last ditch guns and early guns and all that kind of stuff, um, Type 14s give you some pretty cool options. Type 14s are pretty common in the U.S. collector's market today um, because of, you know, American troops bringing them back. You know, the Japanese lost the war. They had strict gun control after the war. Um, so both during and after the war, just tons of these, uh, these Type 14s were sent back to the United States. Um, you know, with a pistol, it's very, you know, light and easy. It's, it's very easy for guys to just, you know, put these in a bag or box or whatever, send it back home. Um, back, back in World War II, it was legal for guys to just, you know, mail pistols back home. Um, so a lot of these ended up back in the United States. Um, not a lot stayed in Japan. So um, these are really cool collectible guns and, and they're pretty common. Um, these were the most produced military pistol uh, of the Japanese. About 65% of their total handgun production um, is in these Type 14 Nambus. Uh, they made somewhere between 277,000 and 282,000 of these pistols made. So it's not like in the millions or whatever, like, like you might expect, um, but still it's in the hundreds of thousands. Who knows how many of those made it back to the United States, but I mean, probably tens of thousands made it back to the United States. So these, these are pretty common and they're not crazy expensive really. Like as far as, you know, a major power in the war handguns kind of go, like if you compare this to like German pistols or whatever, these are pretty affordable. They're, they're going up in price like everything else, but, but these are pretty affordable um, and they're neat. There's a lot of, like you saw, there's a lot of variances in type 14s, which is pretty neat. Um, you know, the five different makers of these guns, they made these for about 20 years, so it's pretty neat. You got lots of years, a lot of features, a lot of changes made to the gun, so um, I think they're really cool, pretty highly collectible. Um, I think these are one of those guns that you'll see the prices kind of going up. Um, so I'd recommend getting into these um, if you have any interest in World War II or, or you know, or Axis Power or Japanese stuff, um, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think these are really, really cool pistols. Um, this might be probably my favorite Japanese pistol just because of all the variations and, and, and how common they are in the U.S. You know, obtainability, I think, is a pretty big thing when, when you're trying to collect something. So 
Um, I think these are really neat. Uh, I highly recommend you checking, checking them out next time you see one. Now, if you're wanting to get into Japanese pistols, I highly recommend you get this book. Uh, Japanese Military Cartridge Handguns, uh, 1893 to 1945, by Harry Derby and James Brown. Um, this is a great book, and there's a paragraph in this book that I would just love to read to you, because I think this summarizes a lot of the collector's love for this pistol. And this is one of the most, like, beautifully written paragraphs describing a, a handgun I've ever read. The Type 14 design also represents a significant aesthetic achievement. The use of circular forms in the trigger guard, magazine latch, barrel extension, cocking knob, and magazine gripping surface, together with its complementary curves in the trigger, frame, and forward face of the receiver bridge, all create a pleasing symmetry. The slender barrel and long grip with its parallel grooves following the axis of the barrel add grace. The parallel magazine gripping grooves, while discontinuous with the grip panel grooves, and framed by the shaping of the bottom of the grip panels with its grip screw located as to add harmony between its circles and that of the magazine grip in a manner that is distinctly Japanese. The rear sight profile and front sight shape add a streamlined effect, and the unique undercut rear sight groove provides an unusual sense of precision to the shooter. The color balance between the deep rust blue strawing on key parts and rich wood hues in the grip panels is striking. Even the location and execution of frame markings, particularly in pre-war specimens located in Nambu's own Coco Bungee factory, demonstrate artistic balance and symmetry endowed by the pistol's designer. Uh, poorly read, but I think that is probably one of the most beautiful paragraphs I've ever read written about any gun. I mean, that's, I mean, whichever author wrote that, you could tell by that, that they really loved the Type 14. Now help me fight the YouTube algorithm by subscribing, commenting, sharing, all that kind of stuff. It really helps fight the, uh, the YouTube's anti-gun policy. Um, this is my son, Eric, by the way. Um, and this is his Millsurp World onesie. Um, I sell these Millsurp World onesies and shirts and stuff on my Teespring. Uh, the link is below the video. Uh, check it out. Every purchase goes to support the channel. Um, greatly appreciate everything you guys do. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Yay! Good He's job, so cute. Eric. He's so cute. Thanks so much for doing that, You're baby. Welcome.